as Phil just said, he's the ADA coordinator for the, the city of Edmond. And my name is Christy Avalos with Accessology. Brian Schamberger and Aaron Yurick are with Kimley Horn. And together we're the team that has been hired to help uh, the city of Edmond with the ADA transition plan. Now, um, transition plans are a required element um, for, from the ADA. And we're gonna talk tonight about what, what a transition plan is, what it does, um, and all of those kinds of things. So we'll start just by talking about what the goals and objectives are for the city of, of Edmond. And the, there's a lot of different goals that they have, okay? Uh, they want to improve access for everybody. But at the same time, they you know, want to comply with the law. But the heart is to just see how they can do what they do better. Um, what is it that is offered by the city of Edmond that does th that works well and what, what doesn't work well. And so we're trying to get input from the public on, on those different things. Um, we also, as part of this project, we've educated the staff on different disability issues. I don't think I said this, but I've been, I've been working with disability issues since 1977. So none of this is new. Um, and we're really just trying to help them understand their responsibilities as well as um, how they can do what they do better. Um, in this process, we develop a list of barriers. It can be a communication barrier, or it can be a physical barrier, um, but we have to find those throughout the entire city in order for them to get on a list to be resolved. And that's, that's kind of what the transition plan is for. Um, then once we have all of the, the issues, then we have to figure out how to resolve them. So there's a plan that has to go in place, and, and all of this is part of the transition plan project. Now, ADA is broken into several different titles. A city like Edmond um, is a Title II entity because they receive public funds. Anybody who receives public funds uh, falls under Title II, and Title II has some requirements that other that, that Title III doesn't have. Title III is your, your businesses and your restaurants and things like that. And they're not required to do a transition plan, but a Title II entity is. So this just kind of lists the requirements of the transition plan. Um, the first thing is to uh, designate an ADA coordinator, which is what Phil is, the ADA coordinator. Um, then there has to be some type of a complaint or grievance process. So if you were to participate in a um, uh, a program that's offered by the city and you found that in that process you got discriminated against, you need to go know who to go to. And ultimately it's Phil. But there's a process, a grievance process online where you can fill out the form and, and let them know what happened so that we can get, in, get it into a process to get it resolved. Okay, now part of that also um, has an appeal. If you don't like the initial answer, there's an appeal process for you know to go a step further until you get um, get a final resolution. Uh, there's also it, it's very important that the uh, design standards that uh, an entity is using comply with the most current um, enforceable standard. And so, as part of this process, we've been looking at the design standards that they use to make sure that we've achieved compliance or that they're, they're able to achieve compliance because they're using an up-to-date standard. Um, it's important that as a municipality, they are notifying people of their responsibility as a city um, to you know, not dis discriminate against people with disabilities and, uh, and that kind of thing. And then, um, again, identifying any of the barriers that we can find uh, to access whether it's in a program service or activity, or whether it's in a building. So transition plans are a requirement under the law. Cities have to have them. You actually see this lobby, I'm gonna be standing in front of it here. Um, the cities have to have them, first of all, because they can't fix a barrier if they don't know it's there. So it, it, it identifies the barriers that they have in their program. They've got you know, buildings and things that have been here way before ADA that you know, probably need some work, as does any community um, anywhere in, in the country. Um, it's also, yeah, I mentioned the grievance process before, that's an important piece of it. 
as well as um, just the fact that it, it's a requirement. The law says that a municipality has to have a transition plan, and that law is administered by the Department of Justice. So at any point, if the Department of Justice or the federal entities uh, wanted to um, you know, ask for a transition plan, uh, there'd be, there would be um, penalties or repercussions if a city didn't have one to, um, to give them. And so we are in the process of developing that plan itself. Now, there is a term that is often, often, um, kind of come over here. Uh, there's a term that's often used that people hear a lot called reasonable modification. Uh, and it's important to, to understand that sometimes there's a policy in place and it's been in place for years, and nobody actually has taken a look at it until it gets challenged. And so um, a, an entity is required to make a reasonable modification to that, to that policy if they determine that the policy itself is, is discriminatory. So an example of that would be, let's say you have to have a driver's license in order to check out a library book, but then you have somebody with a disability who doesn't drive, then that would be discriminatory. That would basically be saying you can't check out a, a library book. So they have to modify that policy to meet that need. And that's what we're looking at is the different policies and procedures that are in place and, and maybe areas where they might need to be modified. Now, um, every program or inaccessible element that we find through this process has to be identified and, and, and put on a list. Once we have a list of everything, then we can start figuring out what the highest priority is, what needs to be fixed first, um, what might be able to wait a little bit, but you have to have the list first, and that's called the self-evaluation process. So the, so the city of Edmond has gone through this self-evaluation process, and we've been collecting data um, on all the sidewalks and all the curb ramps and all the buildings and um, all the program services and activities to determine what needs to be resolved um, to make Edmond a, a, a friendlier place for people with disabilities. So through this process, we will identify the different steps that are necessary for them to take. Um, we'll get input from people like you. Um, we had another meeting earlier today where we got some input from the public. And it's important that we have that input because what we might think is the highest priority isn't your highest priority. So we need to know what your highest priority is because you're a citizen here, and, and, and that's, that's one of the things that we want to, um, you know, we, we need to get input on. Now, um, in developing this process, um, although the law calls the, a municipality to have an ADA coordinator, one person really can't handle everything for an entire city. Um, cities are too big and there's too many departments, and there isn't one person who understands what goes on in every department. So we put together a thing called a liaison team. And that liaison team is basically um, a representative from all of the major departments working together as kind of mini ADA coordinators for their department and feeding information to Phil so that he can figure out what to do with it. Okay, and so that liaison committee has been, um, was developed right at the beginning before we even started the self-evaluation process. So the liaison committee came first, then we did the self-evaluation. We're in the process now of developing the document itself. Um, and then we will help them determine some pot potential funding sources that can be used, um, as well as we did some training last month. We did, uh, actually, part of it was this month. Uh, we did some training for the, the, the city. Um, so all of this is kind of all-encompassing. It educates them, it educates the community, and it pulls together all of the information into a single document that anybody can review. Now the liaison committee um, has been very, it's, it's very important for them to guide us. Um, if, we're, if we're going down a path and one of them feels like that's the wrong path for their department, then they speak up and we can adjust the path accordingly. So the, the, the plan is truly tailored for, um, for the city of Edmond. Okay. Now, all of the different areas that we looked at, I mentioned um, earlier, we, it's everything. There isn't anything that the city does that isn't reviewed through this process, at least 
um, at least to some degree. Okay, so everything from their policies and practices to their standards to their buildings to their curb ramps to their sides to their parks to everything. Okay, now program access is more than um, just like their parks and recs program. It includes well, their sidewalks are a program, their curb ramps are a program. So sometimes the the infrastructure is actually part of a program. It can also be. Um, there are community programs. It can be city-sponsored events that happen annually, um, like you know art festivals or something. <laughs> Those kinds of things that ha that happen annually. So anything that the city does, where the city interacts with the citizens, um, has to be reviewed as part of the programs that they offer. But it also goes into their hiring and firing practices and job descriptions and do they have discriminatory language in. Um, in their hiring and firing practices and all of those kinds of things. Now we look at the boards and commissions to determine, first of all, where, where are they held? Are they held in an accessible location? What if somebody were, um, were hearing impaired or visually impaired who wanted to participate uh, on one of the boards or commissions? Would they be able to? What, what modifications might have to be made so that they could have full participation? So we look through all of that kind of stuff as well. Uh, with the facilities, we've done a number of different elements. Um, we start with, uh, for a building, we start with a parking lot because it doesn't do any good to have an accessible building if you can't get to it. So we look for the accessible parking and an accessible path of travel from the parking to the building. Does it have an accessible entrance? Um, you know, all of those kinds of things. Then we looked at all the different intersections. Do they have curb ramps? Are, there, um, are they signalized? Uh, are there push buttons for people to cross? All of those kinds of things are important as well. So these are the these are the um, numbers of, of elements that we looked at. There were 14 buildings total and 15 parks. Those have all been looked at. There were 73 or 72 signalized intersections, and then um, just oh, just over 66 miles, 66 and a half miles of sidewalk was all evaluated as part of this process. So these are just the different buildings that we looked at. It's a list of um, the different, you know, the main buildings that, that make up the city. Um, the fire, um, fire children's safety um, program was part of it, and your courts and your police departments, and um, you know, this building, community buildings, and things like that. Those were all part of the evaluation that we did, and that just kind of shows you where they are in the in the, the big map. And different things that we found, and, and these pictures aren't all from, uh, from Edmond, and that's, that's purposefully, uh, because we, we want people to understand that it's not just an Edmond problem, it's not just an Oklahoma problem, these are nationwide problems. And so we'll find, uh, we, we have pictures from all over, because we want people to understand that, um, that this is a great move, to, uh, a great step in moving forward, um, but they are by no means behind where everybody else is in the country. So we found things like non-compliant parking. Um, this particular parking uh, doesn't have any signage, and signage is a, is a requirement for an accessible parking space. Um, we had some. We have often have areas where you've got older buildings, and this building is a really good example where you have some accessible entrances and some that aren't. And all of the the um, entrances that are not accessible need to have signage that clearly indicates the location of the nearest accessible entrance. So we find those kinds of things. We find um, slopes in front of doors where they're not supposed to be. Um, we find areas where there's just no accessible route between buildings whatsoever. Um, and that can be an interior issue as well. A lot of times there's, um, you know, there's counters where employees are, are, are serving citizens, um, but the employees couldn't get back to that area, and that would prevent them from having a job. Okay, there are sometimes overhead protrusions. Um, it's Friday. Um, well, it's Friday. It's Friday. It's almost Friday. Um, <laughs> it's Friday with no sleep. There we go. Uh, anyway, overhead protrusions where um, you know somebody who is visually impaired, their pain might not detect it, and they would hit their head before they actually um, you know knew that it was there. And then sometimes there are ramps or there are elements put in place, but that element doesn't comply. It's not wide enough or the slope is too steep or it wasn't designed in accordance with the standards. And that's also an issue because 
If you're going to put in uh, um, accessibility, you might want to put it in in compliance. So those kinds of things need to be looked at as well. If we find um, steep slopes, really steep slopes, um, then that might be a, um, a higher priority. If it can be a, a, an area that's dangerous and things like that, uh, that would be a higher priority than, for instance, something that might just be a little bit off. The, anything above 8.33% is, is a violation. The question is, how far above that is it, and is it dangerous? Is it a high priority or a medium priority or a low priority? And all that gets figured out after all of the data comes in. Okay, so this one, for instance, is 25.4%. That's hugely out of compliance and a liability. So that would be something that would go onto a high priority list. Uh, a lot of times there's seating, whether it's at a park or uh, an amphitheater or, you know, for, for the, the baseball games or the softball games or the soccer games or whatever. Um, wherever seating is offered, we have to have accessible seating as well. Wherever there are restrooms, you have to have accessible restrooms. So we've been looking um, at all of the restrooms in the buildings, but also in the parks and um, areas for um, you know, wherever we found restrooms. Door maneuvering clearance is a big issue with doors, and that's a big issue, again, nationwide. Uh, on the pole side of the door, you're always required to have 18 inches. That allows somebody in a wheelchair to get out of the, the swing of the door, open the door, and then be able to move in. And so that's, that, that's a very important element for somebody, not just in a wheelchair, but using canes, crutches, and walkers, and things like that. Uh, and we find a lot of places where we don't have that uh, 18 inches. A lot of break rooms don't comply. We don't have compliance sinks and knee clearance underneath them and things like that. Now on the parks, these are the parks that we looked at. Um, before I move into parks, do you have any questions on buildings or input or thoughts or ideas or shall I move on? Who's going to pay for the interpreter services? Is that from the city of Edmond or who, who, I mean, sorry, who's going to pay for the repairs? The city pays for that? Or the city will pay for that, yeah. And we'll talk a little bit about funding in, in, uh, towards the end of the presentation. Okay, yeah. great. So these are the parks that we, that we looked at. And parks are, they're, they're different because the enemy, the enemies, oh, I'm doing great tonight, the speech, the amenities are, um, are vast. And they, you know, no park is the same. There's a whole bunch of different things that have to be looked at. But we do have to make sure that anything that's offered by that park is, is offered in compliance. It, it works for everybody. And so, again, this is the map of the different parks that we looked at. Um, and some of the things that we found, just like with the buildings, non-compliant uh, parking, or um, no accessible route to the different amenities. And often what we found in parks is that um, they'll have a route around the park, a nice concrete path, but you can't get off that path and into any of the amenities. Um, and so it really doesn't serve the amenities the way that it's supposed to. Uh, we also found a lot of non-compliance with um, concession stands and things like that. They're too high, they don't work for either people of short stature or people who uh, use wheelchairs. And then uh, I mentioned seating before. So these are just some examples of non-compliant parking. Um, a lot of places, for whatever reason, think if they paint that wheelchair symbol on a parking space, they've made it compliant. Um, and it doesn't. <laughs> it has to have a number of different features in order for it to be a compliant parking space. So we find a lot of that. We find a lot of attempts at access that are almost laughable, that this, is, this would be a huge liability. Um, and luckily, that's not in Edmond. <laughs> it is in Oklahoma, though. Looks like a skate park. Uh, it's not. <laughs> it looks like one, but it's not. Um, these are restrooms at a park, and again, you know, we had non-compliant elements. These ones were brand new, and there was this huge slope getting up to them, which I thought was interesting. But this is what I was talking about before. We've got a sidewalk that goes all the way around that park, um, or that playground, but there's no actual way for a child to get from that sidewalk, if they're in a wheelchair, to get from that sidewalk into actually play on the, on the uh, pieces of equipment. So that's something that we have to look at, as well as the surfacing underneath. Um, there are specific requirements to the surfacing so that kids in wheelchairs um, can use it, but also if kids fall, they don't get hurt. And so there's a balance between those two requirements. I, I mentioned um, the uh, concession stands. 
a little bit ago. This is a, kind of a good example of the, the issue that we have at ballparks. They have the dugout, and there, you see a level change there, but there's another level change to get from the dugout onto the field. So a child using a, a wheelchair wouldn't be able to participate with the other, with the other kids. That's good. Mm -hmm. So you said this is with Title II and Title III. So what's the difference between Title II and Title III? It, it's, this, is a, this is a requirement only for Title II. A Title II entity is any entity that receives public funds. So it could be a municipality, a school district, uh, a university. And a Title III entity would be something that is privately funded, like your restaurants and your gas stations and your you know, home depots and things like that. Those are privately funded companies. So a privately funded company doesn't have to have the transition plan, but a Title II entity or a municipality does. Okay. So like the ramps, like at our cross section? I'm curious. Um, like, um, like if you're putting like an addition to a home, and it's near a, a crosswalk. Do they have to have a ramp there? Yes. The crosswalk. Yes. Any place there's a sidewalk. A sidewalk is an implied pedestrian route, and an implied pedestrian route has to be an accessible road. So that's that's what the community. Correct. But what yeah. about like a private home? The private homes aren't covered under ADA. And Brian's going to kind of talk about sidewalks a little bit. Okay, we'll, we'll switch gears a little bit. Um, as part of the evaluation, uh, we did include um, almost 65 miles of public sidewalk. And those were collected on the arterial roadways, the major roadways within the city. Um, we have completed about um, just over 57 miles of that, so we still have a little bit of work to do. And we're going to wrap that up within the next a month or so. Uh, during that process, and again, the evaluation is look and see what's compliant, what's not compliant. We determined that about uh, just over 50% of the sidewalk that we evaluated has some technical issue there that makes it not compliant. So again, as part of the transition plan, we're going to identify those locations and then uh, put develop a list of locations and how, depending on how severe those locations are, We'll prioritize those and uh, develop a plan to fix those, uh, those issues. This map gives you an example uh, or shows visually where we, uh, the inventory that we uh, gathered. Uh, everything in red and green is the total number of miles that were included. Uh, the green is the, the, the sidewalk along materials that we completed, and the red is the remaining sidewalks that have yet to be. We've got a long list here of uh, some of the issues associated with curb ramps. So we'll talk a little bit about curb ramps and sidewalks and intersections. Uh, <coughs> and as there are curb ramps at traffic signals and then there are curb ramps at driveways and cross streets. Uh, wherever you have sidewalks that are intersecting uh, curbs, we, we expect to see curb ramps. In some cases, they didn't exist at all. Uh, in many cases, they had design issues or construction issues that cause them to be non-compliant. They may have been missing uh, a level landing area at the top of, of the, the curb ramp itself. The cross slopes may have been, uh, they may have exceeded that 2% cross slope. Uh, there are the flares, you know, if you have a, although it's not a part of the accessible route, uh, where you do have, you know, like a concrete section adjacent to a curb ramp, you need to have those flared sides. And in some cases, those did, those did exceed uh, the maximum uh, uh, slope requirements. So what we did, we went and evaluated those, we documented those, and put that in a database, and then we're going to evaluate which ones actually need to be improved. The next few slides uh, show some pictures of some issues that we see that are pretty common in the field uh, related to curb ramps. Uh, you know, we have to have some color contrast on the ramps. Uh, 
a lot of that's handled with the, the truncated domes, which also uh, gives a tactile warning for someone who may have a, uh, maybe visually impaired. And uh, again, I mentioned earlier the flares. Sometimes you have really steep flares, and if someone was in a chair and they were negotiating that ramp, and if they went up on that flare, that could that could cause a really severe problem for them. They could tip over the, the chair. Uh, it, could, it could be a, a, a pretty unsafe condition. Uh, there can be just obstructions in the ramp with debris. Uh, there may not be a ramp at all. So that's the case where we definitely, when you have a, an obvious sidewalk that's it's a, coming up to a curb, we need to install a curb ramp there. You can have cut-through ramps that really don't line up, or they're not uh, they're 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 not uh, 90 degrees, or not parallel to the actual uh, route the path of travel. There may be another example where you're missing the actual landing, which is at the top of the ramp, which is required, which would allow you to get access to either the sidewalk or to be able to maneuver and turn, or even have a connection to maybe the push button that's close by. And for in talking about push buttons, which were at the uh, signalized intersections, we also documented some of the common issues there. In some cases, you may have, um, they may not have been the, the push buttons are actually required to be a two inch diameter now. They used to have some of the old, you'll see the old pencil or the eraser type of style that used to be in place. Those are not defined anymore. Yeah, very difficult to, to, to actually push those buttons if, if they're not the larger diameter. Uh, they may be, um, the height may be too high or too low, depending on the, the, uh, the installation. Uh, there may not be an actual, I mean, the, there may be a separation in between the actual sidewalk. And so if there's a gap, someone who has a, uh, may, may, could not get, actually get access to that push button, that creates a challenge and it, it makes that non-compliant. So again, similar to what we did for the, the, the curb ramps, we. We looked at different issues, and this will be summarized in the reports for each of the intersections that we looked at, and we'll kind of put um, a list of what needs to be done to, to, to improve these uh, the conditions. More, more pictures here about uh, some of the push button installations, the things that we see common. There's no actual, there's a requirement that immediately adjacent to the push button, you need to have um, a clear space there for them uh, right in front of the push button, um, that, that there's also a, a distance requirement. It can't be any more than 10 inches away from the push button. And it also needs to be um, level. Uh, we didn't show the picture of that, but sometimes you'll have uh, steep grades there or it's not, it can't, it can't be any more than 2% in any direction adjacent to that push button. Related to sidewalks, there's some common issues there where sidewalks over time, you can add utilities or tree roots or just settle in the ground where there you'll start to see heaving and sinking and cracking and ponding. Uh, again, we talked a little bit about obstructions where you can't have an obstruction along a sidewalk that's really more than a quarter inch. That's uh, considered to be a tripping hazard. Cross slopes shouldn't be anything more than 2%. Uh, when you, Sidewalks also cross driveways, so when they do cross a driveway, it's important that the route they cross, that again, that 2% cross slope uh, is a requirement. So you'll see steep driveways, and if you're trying to come across a 2% and you get hit by a 10% cross slope, that can really have a, a pretty severe impact on your, on your travel, uh, which creates a, a dangerous condition. And same thing for cross streets. Uh, most people don't understand that when, a, when, a, when an intersection two streets cross, and there's a, a pedestrian route crossing that side street, the maximum cross slope on this right street along that maybe a crosswalk or in between those two ramps, it can't be any more than 2% either. So it's important that when you're designing these roads and the city's doing that, that they make sure that they're looking at that and thinking about that when they're uh, designing the streets. Some more photos on, on sidewalks. I mentioned you can have some pretty severe cracks. Um, maintenance, you start to see trees and vegetation along the roadway. Once that gets out there, that actually impedes travel. Uh, utility obstructions, you can have a manhole or, or uh, utility boxes that are actually in the sidewalk and 
those can sometimes uh, create level changes and um, be a tripping hazard. Uh, there's, uh, at times you'll see that the sidewalks start to break up and grass and vegetation start to overgrow and again that's a, pretty, uh, it's a tri tripping hazard as well. Sometimes drainage issues and ponding, so when the sidewalk sinks down, you have any type of well, uh, drainage issues, and you'll start to see ponding there, and that, that collects debris. Uh, same thing too, I, mean, I mentioned that when you, when in the joints in the sidewalk, you'll sometimes see the grass start to grow up there, and that in fact becomes again another tripping hazard. Well, Christy mentioned earlier, we're, you know, um, who, who pays for these things? Who makes all the improvements? Well, obviously the city's, uh, doesn't have unlimited resources to go do these things, uh, but they do want to start developing a plan now on how to actually fund the improvements. So at the end of the day, uh, we're going to identify the improvements, or at least the, the, the areas that need to be fixed, and we're going to tell them how much it's going to cost to fix it. It's going to be put on a list of projects, and then it's up to them to figure out uh, a schedule on when they can do that. And they've got flexibility in how they need to do that, as long as it's reasonable. So they're going to start looking at different funding sources, and those funding sources can, can be anything from looking for grants from the state or the federal government, maybe from the, uh, the local metropolitan planning organization. They have uh, local programs that they could uh, request a, uh, funding for projects of this type. Uh, they can obviously satisfy those uh, the funding locally within their own uh, budgets, and they can even look at different uh, private funding sources. So there's a, a long list of opportunities at the federal level that they can maybe apply for grants. We just listed a few of these. Um, lots of opportunities, and depending on what the needs are, they may be eligible to, to apply for a certain type of uh, grant programs. They've done this on other projects before. There's some projects related to schools called Safe Routes, Safe Routes to School, where you know providing safe routes. Uh, better access between the neighborhoods and the actual schools where sidewalks don't exist. That's a program that's been around for years that uh, historically cities have been able to, to receive uh, local funds to improve projects. This gives you a list of some of those federal projects or federal programs um, that they could uh, apply for. Um, local funding Obviously, the city has their general fund, which that may be funded through sales tax, and they could issue debt to potentially do some capital projects uh, through bond issue, uh, issuance. Uh, they could reallocate some of their existing budgets to uh, fund some of the, 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 these maintenance type projects or some of the uh, capital projects. Uh, they could even create uh, special taxing districts uh, called the TIF district where maybe they look at the, the the sales tax revenue within an area and they can apply those, those the, the dollars generated within those districts to, to fund capital projects. Uh, and then they're just their regular CIP projects. I mean, they have, you see projects all over the place, whether it's uh, buildings or facilities or uh, roadway projects where they're doing maintenance. They will start to look at accessibility and ADA improvements as part of those normal projects. And they've been doing that for years. It's now just uh, continuing doing that and making sure they're including these types of improvements within the scope of those projects. Occasionally, um, they, will get, they will work with private uh, groups, maybe a, a local uh, endowments or uh, that could be anything from a private development that's uh, making improvements as part of their redevelopment or project. They want to take advantage of that opportunity, and especially along the frontage of their property, to have them make those, whether it's a sidewalk improvement or uh, upgrades to their facilities to make sure that anything that they put in is compliant, which is a requirement anyway. And if you, kind of talked about this earlier, if you came with your checkbook tonight, they're more than happy to, to uh, take a check from you to help fund some local projects. There you go. Unfortunately, oh, okay. no, sorry about that. Right. But we've got your information and we'll be sure to follow up. <laughs> so, I'm going to turn it back over to, to, to Christy to talk a little bit about the track and the training she completed. Yeah, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned earlier that we did some training. Um, we did one that was kind of a general ADA, just 
informational training. We did one that was specific to the exterior elements, the um, curb ramp sidewalks and how do you get old curb ramps and sidewalks into compliance and things like that. And then we did one that was specific to customer contact employees. Um, how do you communicate with somebody who is hearing impaired? How do you communicate with somebody who has cognitive impairments? Um, how do you guide somebody who is visually impaired? All of those different issues, um, along with political correctness and all of that kind of stuff, was in, the, um, in, in that training. So those have been complete. Those were completed for the, um, the, the city staff um, just this month. So the next things that we start working on is taking all this information that's been gathered over the last 10 months and put it into the plan. Figure out the costs, get, um, get all of the reports in place and start laying out what the, what the, the transition plan document is going to look like. Um, so we, we will include any comments that you have and comments that we received at, at the meeting that we did this afternoon. Um, any comments that come in to fill afterwards on areas where um, you know, you'd know like to see something maybe become a higher priority. Uh, and then we'll develop uh, an implementation schedule. Once we know what the, what the impact is, then we'll figure out how long it'll take to actually be able to bring everything into compliance. But we need your input. We need the input from, um, from the general public because, like I said before, they can't fix it if they don't know it's broken. And so when we get your input, um, elements or areas that are important to you go higher in the, in the transition plan. They, go, they become a higher priority because we know they directly affect somebody. Um, so we need to get, we need to know uh, how you think the city is doing, um, areas where they can improve, maybe areas where you think they're doing a good job. Um, you know, do you have any issues in any of the, the, the public buildings that you've been in or any of the parks that they have? Um, any of the programs that you've tried to access, all of those kinds of things. And then we want to know what, what would be your highest priority. If, if the, the city of Edmond could only spend a dollar, where should that dollar go? Um, where, where's, where is it most important to you? So we need to have that kind of input so that we can, as we develop the plan, we're making sure that we're taking the, um, the needs of the community into consideration. And that's kind of what um, what the public meetings are for. So you have Phil's card. I've put Phil's information up there. But at this point, we want to hear from you. Put you right on the spot. Hot seat. Remember, you're speaking for all of Edmond right now. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. But I've learned a lot from this presentation, the situations with the different, you know, between a business and like the Title II and the Title III, the differences. I hadn't realized that. But I knew, you know, some about Title III and I had told them, you know, they needed to improve in different areas, but I didn't know that a Title II was different um, and there are different requirements. But as far as the sidewalks go, are they all required at the intersections to have a sidewalk, or like if it's if it's near a, a neighborhood at the end of that sidewalk, are they required to have a ramp to go down? Um, because I've noticed that a lot of the sidewalks in the neighborhoods are not necessarily appropriate. They have a lot of the waves and the bumps and the cracks and stuff. Do are those required to be fixed as well? Yeah. Um, once an accessible road is in place, then it has to be maintained in an accessible condition. Now, ADA doesn't require that they put in sidewalks. Every municipality has its own process to determine whether sidewalks are needed. Um, what it does require is that once a sidewalk is there, it is compliant. So if you have a sidewalk, you have to have curb ramps and that it's maintained in an accessible condition. Now, some of the sidewalks in neighborhoods may not, may not be owned by the city. They may be owned by the HOA or by the, the developer. or So the city may not be responsible for every sidewalk, um, but somebody is. Do you know who, how would we know what area, if we wanted to file a complaint or to inform that organization, would you guys have that information or how could we, how could we file a grievance on that? 
what I what I would say, and Phil, jump in here. I would say get get the complaint to Phil, and then he can figure it out, or his team can figure out who it ultimately needs to go to.